Churches can have a missions ministry, but to be missional, to be on mission, is to be obedient to the call of Jesus to go and make disciples, whether that be across the street or on the other side of the world. When we really started organizing the mission trips, to have family trips, some of the places we go is really not good for families, but we can, you can find places to take the family. And what a great bonding, not only for church members on mission trip, but also for families. Beth and I went to Uganda in 1998. Then we, we developed a relationship with those pastors and kept going back. And our mode of operation, I guess, would be to train pastors in the morning, and then we would take those pastors and go to a village where they wanted to plant a new church, do hut-to-hut -hut evangelism, conclude the afternoon with a service out in the open, and uh, preach the gospel. And the way they do it over there, they give the invitation to come to Christ and wait for the first person to either stand up or to come forward. And when that first person stands to come forward, they look at that person as the one who opens the door. And that's when they start singing. <laughs> Because they say, we're joining in with the angels now. One has come to the Lord. We came back with that vision of indigenous missionaries, supporting indigenous missionaries, developed the guideline that if we go, it's for the purpose of going back. We want to develop relationships with the people there. We're not just going and dumping on them everything that we think they need. No, we're going and it's a mutual a relationship. We wanted every missionary from this church to be sent and supported and we made a big deal that they would come down before they went for prayer. The whole church knew they were going, what the deal was. And when they came back, we let them share the testimonies about what happened so the whole church could share. First Baptist Bernie, Beth and I love you more than you can imagine because being a member here with you changed us as we saw God's missionary heart flourish in this congregation and none of us have gotten over it and we pray that we never will. So thank you for being the people of God in this place, sharing the love of God all over the world. Let's keep doing it for the glory of God. Amen. It is such a, a great honor to get to be here, uh, even in this place, on this stage, to talk to you about missions, because this is a heartbeat of this church. In fact, some people would say this is why we exist. We exist so that the kingdom of God will expand through us to the people in our lives and to the very ends of the earth. That's Acts 1-8, right? That'll be Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and to the very ends of the earth. And so this is the heartbeat of who we are. And so once a year or twice a year, we get to spend some time specifically focused on what God's doing, both through our people and around the world with others that we've met uh, along the way. Uh, I want to give you a quick quote from Christopher J. Wright. He said, it's not so much the case that God has a mission for his church in the world as that God has a church for his mission in the world. Mission was not made for the church. The church was made for mission for God's mission. That's why we exist. This church has known that for 125 years they've been here uh, in Bernie serving this community and, and sharing the, the, the light of the gospel here and around the world. And it's been an incredible thing. You know, this is, it's why Baptists in the United States actually began to work together. It was in the 1700s when they realized that what the world needed was more than just a congregational uh, representation. We need to cooperate so that we could send people to the nations. The first Baptist missionary sent out was a guy named Adoniram Judson. Maybe you've heard of him. He worked to Burma, and in Burma, God used him to translate the scriptures, and even now today, it's the, the single best translation of God's word being used in Burma, now Myanmar. It's an incredible thing that God began then and continues today. You can hear it every time we talk. You hear it when Pastor Jason preaches. You hear it if you go to the classes that, that Pastor Daniel and other leaders lead. You hear us talking about missions all the time. You hear us talking about the kingdom of God and how it reaches out to the nations. The vision to see the gospel spread to everyone, everywhere, continues to drive us outwards. That vision has impacted my own family in so many ways. You know, I met my wife, Elise, on a mission trip. I flew into Houston to travel with her family to Mexico to a children's home that her family runs, and the rest is history. 
<laughs> um, I think my father-in-law still regrets that history. <clears throat> We, uh, I was a missions pastor in Seattle. It was so much. Missions has been a part of my life for so long. Uh, Elise, when we got married, moved there, and we got to lead teams all over the world in different places. Uh, after a few years, we felt called to go back to that children's home. We moved our family there. Can you imagine from Seattle to Mexico, the culture shock that we experienced? It's a different world in every way. We lived there for a few years until we were ready to have kids and came back to the U.S. Um, if you get to know my family, you know that this idea and this heart for missions goes far beyond me. It is very reflected in my wife. Elise is kind of quiet. She won't tell you all the things that God's done in her heart and life, but she loves to see God's kingdom expand among the nations as well. Our kids have been with us to Mexico multiple times to visit the children's home, and they've seen how God is working both inside them and around others uh, as we've gone on these trips. It is, it is this vision that God wants to take the, the, the gospel to all the nations that drives my family and drives us out. It's a beautiful picture, and I, I pray that it will continue through our children, and one day if they have children, their children as well. But you know, the vision to take the gospel to the kingdoms didn't start with FBC Bernie. It didn't start with Pastor Jason or Pastor Chad or Pastor Daniel or anybody else. We're going to look today at how the kingdom of God began to expand beyond Israel and the Jews all the way back in Acts chapter 13. So if you, are, if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 13. We're going to look at the first couple of verses. We're going to see God do something completely new. It's something that you didn't see in Jesus' ministry himself. What we're going to see here is the, the, the Lord move in their hearts. The Holy Spirit speak to these apostles and they innovate They do something that went far beyond what they had been trained to do. And it's something that we have to be ready to do today. And so look with me, at, at, starting in verse one. It says, now the church at Antioch, where there were prophets, prophets and teachers, they give us a list of some names here. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Verse four says, the two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit went down to Seleucia and sailed from there to Cyprus. Think about this, four verses and how interesting all of this is. It's, it's actually so embedded with incredible information. We could unpack this verse and have multiple sermons on different segments of these verses. We could talk about how they were fasting and praying. Think about this, last week we talked about Peter being released from prison. Do you guys remember the sermon? The church was gathered in, uh, in John Mark's house and, and they were praying for Peter's rescue because James had just been martyred. And they're praying intently and, and the Holy Spirit releases Peter in a powerful way. <clears throat> the angel releases him, he shows up at the door. It's kind of funny because they leave him at the door. They don't believe that it's really him. Think about the difference between the prayer you saw in that chapter, the last sermon, and the prayer we see in this chapter. They're both intent. The church is gathered because of some urgent need in their life. They're gathered, the first one last week, because Peter was in, in grave danger. They expected that he would die the next day like James had. But in this chapter, they've gathered and they're fasting and praying and seeking the Lord's vision, seeking the Lord's direction, seeking the, the Holy Spirit to tell them what's next. How often have you done that? How often have we as a church gathered and said, we have a big thing we need to pray about. We're not sure what God's going to do next through us. This whole idea of fasting and praying with a, with a focus on direction from the Lord is a very interesting thing. And it's one I think that many of our churches today have, have, have walked away from. We have some folks in our church that have a passion for prayer and a passion for, for fasting, but it's something that we as a church don't do often. And I want to tell you this, if there's one first point today for me, I want to say this to you, that a church that wants to see what God's doing must stop, must pray, fast, and listen to hear the Holy Spirit guiding Our next step, sometimes what the Lord leads you to do is very different than what conventional wisdom would say. Why would you send away Barnabas and Paul from your very own congregation to go do something that no one really knows what's next? Why would you send your best leaders and teachers to go somewhere else? 
The only reason is because the Holy Spirit told him this is what's next. Now let's, fo- let's focus a little bit here. I-, I entitled my sermon today, Being Set Apart. And, and we're going to see that Paul and Barnabas are being clearly led to be set apart. But what God is doing is he's calling his church to be set apart from the world and act in ways that don't look and act like everyone else. So what are they set apart from and what are they set apart to are questions that we should ask. We should not ignore the fact that these five leaders that are listed here are from five different national backgrounds. Isn't it interesting that these five leaders in Antioch are a very multicultural group? You you think about Barnabas of Cyprus. Barnabas was a Jew, but he was from the island of Cyprus. And we're going to hear about that again in a minute. Simon from Niger is very very likely an African man from the country we call Niger. Uh, Lucius of Cyrene, it's another area just north of, of Antioch, up, up, up in the northern parts of, of uh, what we call today um, Central Asia. Menaean grew up in the home of, of Herod the Tetrarch. He was part of a royal family. And then Paul, of course, we know from Tarsus, was also a Pharisee. You think about those five guys, and I want to say this really clear. The gospel had so unified them that their commonality in Christ was bigger than their worldly differences. Isn't it amazing to know that God can unify us for his purpose, for his kingdom? And it doesn't matter where you're from, what language you speak, what skin tone your, your, your skin shows. It doesn't matter because we're united in Christ. We are one family. We are brothers and sisters under his headship. What an incredible thing that gives us We could actually spend a lot of time talking about those different guys and the different things they came from. We could talk about how many differences they really had, but we're gonna skip over that today because it'll be a distraction from where I'm hoping we end up. So they prayed and they fasted and the Holy Spirit spoke to them. And, uh, And what God did was something completely unique. He said, set apart for me, Paul and Barnabas, to the work that I'm gonna send them. And I wanna tell you, at this point, at that moment, we have no idea what was gonna happen. So just put yourself in their shoes. Let's say that we had a, we've been fasting for the last several days and we had a prayer service this morning and, uh, and someone stood up and said, I think the Holy Spirit is leading us to send Paul and, uh, and Garrett, where's Garrett? Garrett's over here. Um, and uh, we'd like to set apart from them, we're gonna send them out. Paul and Garrett, where would you go? <laughs> like, uh, we don't know, what's next? So I guarantee you there's more prayer and fasting that happened after this decision was made. There was more that was being built into the whole congregation about what was gonna happen next. And just imagine if you were the guys who were being sent out. Imagine you were the ones who were staying home. The vision and the mission to take the kingdom to the lost doesn't change for either group, and yet God set them apart for something different. So having commissioned them, this is verse four, what did Paul and Barnabas do? It says they they went down to Seleucia and they went to Cyprus. I have a little map for you so you can get an idea where Cyprus is. Uh, Antioch is right there in what we call modern day Syria. It's north of Israel. And Cyprus is this island right off the coast. Now why did they go to Cyprus? Any idea why is Cyprus the place they go? Well, if you jump back with me just a few chapters in, in Acts, Um, There's this really powerful thing that happens. Um, In in Acts chapter 4, it talks about this man named Joseph. He's a Levite from Cyprus who the apostles called Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. He sold a field that he owned and he brought the money and he put it at the apostles' feet. Do you guys remember that story from Acts 4? So here's our first introduction to this man named Joseph who the apostles called Barnabas. And Barnabas is from the island of Cyprus. So I want you to get this. This is a really important part of the story. The very first thing that Paul and Barnabas decide to do as being sent ones from the church is they go to Barnabas' home. Now, why is that such an important thing? It's such an important thing because we've been teaching all about this this whole spring. Barnabas went to his home because it was his oikos. Everyone say the word oikos. All right, good. You know a little Greek now. Oikos is a Greek word for household. It means extended family or relational network. Uh, The households of the first century went far beyond just mom and dad and three kids. 
the, the oikos of the first century was the, the household was the servants in the household or the employees of, of the, the person that owned the household or the extended family. It probably included grandparents or aunts and uncles, uh, cousins. They might have all been within this household. And so when you think about this idea of oikos, it's more than just your immediate wife and kids or, or husband and children. This is your network of relationships. It might include everyone you see on a regular basis. And so their first place to go was to Cyprus. We're going to go across the water to Barnabas's house. And it says they spent several days there going throughout the entire island. Now, again, I want you to think about this. Was this new? Was this part of that Holy Spirit revelation to Paul and Barnabas or the Antioch church. And I want to tell you, it's not. It's not at all. In fact, if we think about uh, Mark chapter one, one of the very first things we see Jesus do when he calls his disciples is go to Peter's home. Do you guys remember that story? Look with me at Mark chapter one, verses 29 through 33. And it says, as soon as they left the synagogue, if you remember in the, in the early part of Mark chapter one, Jesus is walking along the Sea of Galilee and he sees these guys. He says, come follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. Right? So uh, Simon and his brother Andrew, they leave their nets, they follow him, they walk a little further, they find another pair of fishermen, James and John, and he invites them, same words, and they go to the synagogue in Capernaum. Capernaum is the home of all four of these men. And, uh, and then after going to the synagogue, they go to, to, to Simon Peter's home, and the mother-in-law is sick. Do you guys remember this story? Jesus, Jesus heals the mother-in-law. So look at me. Verse 20, I said, as soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, he took her hand and he helped her up. The fever left her and she began to wait on them. That evening after sunset, people brought, G brought to Jesus all the sick and demon possessed. So do you want to know where that happened at? Well, verse 33 says, the whole town gathered at the door. Whose door? Think about it. Whose door? This is Simon Peter's home. The very first place that Jesus ministers with his new disciples is in the home of Simon Peter. So look at the next verse, verse 30, uh, 33. The whole town gathered at the door and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out demons and he would not let demons speak because they knew who he was. Simon Peter, the book of Mark, is the first time we see what's called a person of peace. So what they would do is they would do this. This is a strategy that Jesus used, the apostles later used, and then we see it now starting in the ministry of Paul. And the idea is you go to people that you know and you begin to share the gospel with them and anyone that comes becomes this person of peace. Now there's three things I want you to hear about this person of peace. The person of peace is someone who welcomes the messenger. It's someone that, that is happy to see their friend. They welcome the messenger, then they welcome the message. They hear the message of the gospel and they receive it with joy. It takes root in their life and they began to grow in and become like Christ. And then lastly, and this is the most important, they welcome the mission. They see the work of God in them as so powerful that it needs to impact the lives of the people around them. And so this person of peace is such an important strategy. They work through people they know, their oikos, to find the person that's gonna welcome the messenger, welcome the message, and welcome the mission of the messenger. And so this person, did, did, did Peter, by the way, do all three of those things? Did he welcome Jesus? Peter did in Mark chapter one. Did he welcome the message of Jesus? <clears throat> yeah, it said that day he dropped his nets and followed Jesus. Did he welcome the mission of Jesus? Yeah, of course he did. Well, you, you fast forward and ask the same question. <clears throat> when they went to Cyprus, did they find people who followed Jesus? I, honestly, are Paul and Barnabas people, oh, you're so nice. Like, you're so, you're so kind. I wanna give you a hand. It's just from me, thank you. <laughs> But now you have to wait for me to take a sip. <clears throat> I think about people online, they're like, this guy. <laughs> Barnabas and Paul both are persons of peace. They receive the message, the messenger who shared the faith. They hear the message of Jesus and they take on the mission of Jesus as their own. 
And so let's, let's think about this. Uh, how does that impact us? We've been talking all spring through this witness campaign. Do you remember the witness campaign? We gave you guys boxes and in the boxes were different tools so that you could share your faith with family and friends. Guess what? We didn't use the word oikos, but we were encouraging you <laughs> to go to your oikos and do what? To share the message of the gospel. We're, we're asking you to find people who are gonna welcome the messenger, welcome the message, and we're hoping and praying that they'll welcome the mission of God in their hearts and lives too. Amen? Amen. We have a number of families in our church, maybe many, who have welcomed Jesus in their life. They love the, the message has taken root and they wanna see the kingdom of God expanded among all the peoples of the earth. I want you to watch this video. This is uh, Elisa Hilgemeyer talking about how God has been using her and Greg over the last several years uh, to impact some of the least reached and most difficult places on the earth. So let's watch this video. Reach the Rest is an organization, there's several in the world, but their, their goal is to get the gospel to unreached and unengaged people groups. Unengaged, I think, means that they don't have a church, a place where they can worship, or a, a place, established place. People respond better to someone from their own culture and own language telling them the gospel than someone from, a, from another culture. In a lot of these countries, um, they, they see the Christian church in the English language coming to them as part of the oppressiveness of colonization. So even though the gospel had gone in and it's gone into a lot of places, it kind of stays on the, on the edges and it doesn't go into the country. In order for the gospel to go forward the way that we, we want it to, we need to be reaching the people and not changing the people to look like us. They do like disciple Bible method, which is where they teach them how to, the ones that know how to read, how to take a scripture and read it and ask questions and kind of understand. And then another part of the, of the step was um, understanding that this, the four fields and this, uh, the methods that they use are scriptural they're kind of like what Paul did whenever he would go out and he would seek a person of peace and then he would find the people and he would talk and teach and then people would come and then those that would come to faith and then they would grow. You're seeing that it's growing, like the whole movement in, in Iran. I mean, who did that? Only God could do that. It just seemed to Greg and me that that was worth our time and our money. The privilege of Telling people about Jesus is the biggest joy a person can have. Amen. Amen. It's such a powerful thing. Lisa and Greg are here today. They're going to be uh, helping with the, the, the fundraising luncheon here in a few minutes. And, and you should ask them. When we, when we shared this, this video with her, we, we had about 12 minutes of... Uh, a video feed and, and she tells stories about some of the people she met and the places and we just didn't have time. I wanted to focus on her story because I want you to relate to her, but what they've experienced in these trips, they've gone to Indonesia, they've been in, in, uh, in Turkey, they've been in Iraq, they've been taking the gospel to the places that are some of the most unreached places on the planet and some of the most remote, some that are the most dangerous as well. In fact, some of the people that they've been a part of training in the last several years, some of them have lost their lives uh, over the last year because of their faith in Christ. And you might ask the question, why would somebody like Lisa Hilgemeyer put herself at risk to take the gospel to the most difficult places on the planet? And I think you should ask her. <laughs> it's a great question. What is it that takes, when you, when you accept the messenger and you accept the message and then you accept the mission, what is it that makes it okay to put yourself at risk to see the gospel change the lives of others who are so distant and far and different from us? The Holy Spirit is the right answer. He moves inside of you. We, we, we uh, <clears throat> gave you this magazine when you came in today. It focus, focuses on our international teams and our, uh, our international partnerships. Uh, we have a lot of really amazing local partners as well. And later this year, we're gonna do another um, version of this that includes all of our local ministries and opportunities. Um, but as you look at this, uh, on the last, very last page, and this is a really big deal for me, it's exciting for me to show you. It's blue, it looks like this. 
and it talks about, it introduces, we're uh, affectionately and passionately releasing today our new missions podcast. And uh, we have a 40 minute interview with Lisa, specifically talking about what she experienced in her trip in December when she was working there in the edges of Turkey and, and Iraq. And, and uh, what this is, it's 11 episodes right now that just tell stories. Um, <clears throat> we've interviewed people like Bubba Stahl, we did an interview with Kathy Smith and Joni Weeks after our Starlight Ball. Uh, we've interviewed uh, a pastor from Uganda, Pastor Apollo. And, uh, and what we're trying to do is just give you access to stories. We can't let people stand up here and give you an hour report from their trips. So this is a way for you to listen to it while you're in your car or while you're washing dishes or while you're doing whatever it is that you're doing. Um, this gives you an access to go to the website, to the podcast, and then really download it in any podcast format that you like to listen. Um, in there, you can find stories like what's happening, uh, what, like uh, um, Lisa's uh, interview we talked about. One of the biggest challenges if you're a missions pastor is try to tell stories. The, the kingdom of God is moving and it's an incredible moment in world history and there's so many stories you can't possibly tell them all. Even when we send a team that goes to Chiapas or goes to Yucatan or goes to Moldova, they come back and you have a group of people that all had incredible experiences and God moved in their heart and you want to try to tell the congregation, here's what happened, and you get a three-minute video. It just doesn't give you a space to do it. So this podcast is going to be a really fun way uh, for us to interview more people, for us to tell some of the, the most exciting stories. Uh, some of them will be local stories, some of them will be international stories, uh, but please do check out that podcast uh, this coming week. We We've put a lot of effort into getting that ready uh, over the last few months. <sighs> Finally, what I want to do as we come to our close is I want you to think about what's coming next. What the Holy Spirit started that day in Acts chapter 13 impacts Paul's life on such a powerful way that it defines his next 15 years of life. Over the next several weeks in Acts, we're going to see just how many missionary journeys Paul goes on and, and what happens in all these different regions he visits. He has three missionary journeys. They take about three years each and there's about two years between each of them. So we're talking about a 15 year time frame from when Paul leaves Antioch to where Paul ends up writing the book of Romans. And what happens in that 15 years is he, he travels to these major regions. You might think of Galatia as the first region, first missionary journey. The second one, he ends up in Corinth after traveling through Galatia and past Ephesus. He ends up on the, the, uh, the Achaean Peninsula. And then the last missionary journey, he spends most of his time there in Asia and Ephesus. And, uh, and that's where he, he spends two years teaching and preaching. And Acts 19 says that all of the Jews and Greek that lived in Asia heard the word of the Lord. It's a powerful statement, but I want you to flip with me to Romans 15. Romans 15 is kind of the end of Paul's missionary journeys. He's writing from the city of Corinth to a church planting group that's sent out from Ephesus that now has planted the church in Rome. Paul's never been to Rome when he writes the book of Romans, but he's writing to the Roman church plant that had left from Ephesus that was started by Priscilla and her husband Aquila. You wonder who planted the church in Rome? It wasn't Paul, it wasn't Peter. It was Priscilla and her husband Aquila, which is an incredible thing. Another really fun story we should tell one day. But if you flip with me to Romans 15, starting in verse 19, listen to Paul's words. Now these words are after the 15 years, he's looking back over his ministry journeys and he says this, he says, by the power of signs and wonders through the power of the spirit of God, so from that Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. There's an amen. Who's gonna say amen to that? Okay, good, good, good. It has always been my ambition, Paul says, to preach where, the, where Christ was not known so that I would not be building on someone else's, else's foundation. Rather, as it is written, that those who were not told about him will see and those who have not heard will understand. And Paul says, this is why I've been hindered in coming to you. I wanna show you a map real quick. Let's look at this map. Uh, this, is, this is a really big deal. You see Jerusalem there and you see Illyricum. That's the little green area. If you were to measure the whole thing, you've got about 2,500 miles between these two places. And with the exception of Italy, that's the boot-shaped country to the left of the green, it was the exception, it's the most populated part of the, of the entire world in the first century. About 30 million people live in that space from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum. Listen to Paul's words. I have fully 
proclaim the gospel of Christ. If you go down to verse 23, he says, now there is no more place for me to work in these regions. Think about that word, that line. 2,500 miles, 30 million people, and Paul says there's no longer anywhere that I can work where I'd be working without laying on someone else's foundation. Amen. This, this is a ridiculous statement by Paul. So let me ask you a couple questions. Did Paul preach the gospel to all 30 million people himself? No. Did he plant churches in every single community in that, in that region? No. But you know there were churches being planted that Paul didn't plant? We just mentioned Rome, but uh, the church in Colossae, he wrote the book of Colossians to a church he didn't plant. Here's what happened is in all of these regions between Jerusalem and Illyricum, Paul planted churches that were multiplying throughout their entire region. He had gospels focused Christians who were multiplying outwards so that there could be those verses like the one we read about or the one in Acts chapter 19 that says all the Jews and Greeks in Asia heard the word of the Lord. He was continuing to plant multiplying groups of believers that saw their mission to go and do what Jesus had done. You might think of the verses in the Gospels that says Jesus went throughout all the towns and villages of Galilee. That kind of vision and, and multiplication um, heart was embedded in these believers. In church, I hope that it will be embedded in us. If you look at verse 24, I love this in Romans. He says, I plan to do, um, he's gonna come visit them. I've been longing to visit you for many years. I plan to do so when I go to Spain. I hope to see you while passing through and to have you assist me on my journey there after I've enjoyed your company for a while. This is one of those little humorous things to me. The book of Romans, which is probably one of the most theologically robust books in the New Testament, is Paul's missionary support letter <laughs> to the church in Rome. Uh, he says, by the way, after all these arguments about who Christ is and how the Jews should relate and the Gentiles should relate to Christ and how they should relate to each other, he says, prepare for me something so that you can help me on my way as I go beyond Rome. He's not going to stop and minister in Rome. He's going to visit his friends in Rome. But he sees that the Roman church is capable of saturating their own region with the gospel. So he's not going to stop there. He's going on to Spain. Think about that. Oh, so there's a few questions here. Now there is no place left for me to work in these regions. Church, we've been on this hilltop for a long time. And would you say that there's no place left for us to work in Bernie? No. Would you say that there's no place left in Kendall County or in our region? What if we were to be like Paul and extend that region out 2,500 miles? There's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of work to be done. And we need the whole church to adopt the mission of Jesus so that we can see the whole community reached for Christ. It doesn't mean that all will respond, but it means that all have a choice. They all get to choose for themselves to follow this Jesus or reject him. And we still have work to do. What does it mean to be set apart? That's what it means. That we live and act differently than those around us. I think every church has two core responsibilities. One is that we abide. We abide deeply. The John 15 verse, if you abide in me and I abide in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Right, The church is supposed to encourage the local community of believers so that they go deep with Jesus and it impacts every area of their life. It's the teaching them to obey all that I commanded you from Matthew 28. That's the, that's the first core responsibility of every church, every healthy church, whether it's in Colossians or Colossae or Thessalonica or Bernie. Right? It's to be the body of Christ and go deep with them. But the other one is to ensure that the lost, the least, and the, the last that they all hear the gospel and they have the ability to make a choice to choose Christ or reject him. It's to send workers. When you walk out these doors, you are now sent ones. 
Here we gather together and we can be so happy and, and, and full of life and joy. But when we walk out these doors, we go as Christ's representative, his ambassadors, to wherever you walk next. Now some people are gonna walk out of these doors and fly to some foreign country and they're gonna be what we call classic missionaries. But don't think that because you're not getting on a plane that you don't have a mission. This mission extends to everyone that we see on a day-by-day -day basis, starting with your oikos and going to any others who would hear. As we close, uh, I'm gonna invite our mission teams. There's, there's multiple teams going out this summer. If you're gonna be a part of that mission team, will you come down here to the front? Uh, we have teams for, that are going to the Yucatan. We have teams that are going to Moldova, teams that are going to Uganda, uh, teams that are going to Dominican Republic, and teams that are going um, uh, to Peru, potentially. And uh, while they're coming up, church, I would ask you guys to pray. Commit yourselves to pray. We're talking about prayer and fasting. Pray for these teams. Pray that God will use them for his kingdom and for his glory. Pray about how you're going to encourage them. We have a fundraiser after the, after the second service today where we're going to have lunch. Pray and ask God, how, would you, how is God calling you to encourage these guys and prepare something to send them as they go? Uh, right at the end of our second service, Jason already said this, um, we're going to be giving burgers and, and um, sausage links, and so please do um, plan to attend that, plan to give and contribute to what God's doing. But right now, church, would you guys stretch your hands towards this group? It's a large group, huh? Praise God, there's over 50 people, almost 60 people who are going to go out this summer. And uh, so today we're so excited to see them all here. We're going to pray for them and commission them. And then the weeks before they leave, we're going to pray for them as well. But today, would you guys reach your hands forward and let's pray. Father God, we thank you for those who respond to your Spirit's call. Father, we thank you that they hear your voice. And that something inside them says, I have to do this. We pray, God, that you would use each and every one of these participants, Lord, for this short-term trip, God, this, this, this week or so that they're going to spend in this foreign country. Protect them as they go. Provide for all their financial needs, God. Provide for their families, Lord, while they're away. But God, I pray that you would do something inside of them that makes this not just a one-week thing. That, God, this would be a moment in their life where they see you work. And that, God, they can hold on to it every day, for the rest of their life. That God, some you would call to full time missions. Some you would call to the ends of the earth. Some you would call to unreached peoples. We pray God that you would be glorified through them. God, we thank you again for the many ways that you bless our church and these people right here at the front are one of the greatest blessings we have. Bless them, Father. Put your hand on them. And God, use them to impact the nations. And God, use them to inspire our church. Lord, we look forward to a day when we see so many more people in our church engaging in the needs of our local community and the needs of the world. And we pray, God, that this would be the first fruits. God, standing on the tradition of 125 years of missions, that God, this, this group would be a group that does amazing things. God, we pray that you be honored in their service, glorified in their, their sacrifice, and use them for your kingdom and your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys so much for your service. Thank you so much for going this summer. Church, have you been encouraged today? Yeah. Uh, do you see that God has called us for so much more than coming and sitting in a church? Right, this is the place where we come to get inspired, to be encouraged, to get trained, but we're walking out those doors in a few minutes, and what happens next? Let's dedicate ourselves to seeking God, praying and fasting for the Holy Spirit's inspiration. Let's seek opportunities to engage our oikos and find the persons of peace. Let's accept the challenge of Paul that we not rest until we can say there is no place left. No place left in our hearts, in our families, in our communities, in the entire world. The work is still being done at the very corners of the globe. There's many places that have never heard in all of history the testimony of Christ. That should hurt our hearts. It should drive us out. 
and it should define who we are as set apart ones. Would you stand with me as I pray? Father, we are your people. We are the works of your hands. God, aside from you, our, for our, our sins would block us from knowing who you are or caring at all. And let, Lord, you have opened us to know. You've, you've, incur, you, you've made it possible for us to see you and to pursue you. And we praise you, God. But Father, we know that it's not just that you will bless us. We love those blessings, but it's not just so that you bless us. It's so that your name will be known on the earth and your salvation among all the nations. God, use us for your kingdom. Church, if today is the day where you're hearing the Spirit speak to you and you think you need to respond during this next song, man, say to him the things that only you can say. If you've never asked Jesus to be the king of your life, come down and talk to us. We have pastors down here who would love to hear and talk to you about what it means to follow Jesus with your whole heart. And if you feel God speaking to you about serving in some special way, man, we'd love to hear about it. Church, take these next few minutes to respond to what Jesus is doing inside you.